Today we're talking about stars. We'll talk about how stars work, the different types of stars, and how stars change over time. The most important thing determining how a star develops is the star's mass. Mass is so important because mass produces gravity. Right now, gravity is pulling me towards the center of the Earth. So you probably expect me to be falling into the Earth right now. But actually, that's not what happens. The ground has enough pressure to resist the force of gravity. Gravity and pressure balance each other out, and I stay right here. Inside a star, pressure comes from heat. Like all objects, stars are made up of small particles. The motion of these particles is heat. The faster they move, the higher the temperature. If you cram many particles into a tight container, the particles press against the container walls, producing pressure. The pressure depends on the speed of the particles, or in other words, the temperature. It also depends on the number of particles and the volume of the container. The pressure P equals the number of particles N times temperature T divided by the volume V times a constant R. This is called the ideal gas law. Stars are born inside giant clouds of gas. At first, the gas is spread very thin, but then gravity kicks in and the gas clumps together. Within each of these clumps is a baby star. The baby star grows as gravity pulls in more and more gas. This ball of gas starts to contract. Gravitational energy is turned into heat. The temperature rises, the volume shrinks, and this produces pressure the gas cloud continues to contract until there's enough pressure to fully resist the force of gravity. But gravity depends on mass. A massive star has more gravity, so more pressure is needed to resist it. The gas cloud will continue to contract until the temperature and pressure are high enough to fully resist gravity. Since massive stars have more gravity, they will have more pressure and therefore more heat. The temperature of a star tells us its color. It may be counterintuitive, but blue stars are hotter than red stars. If you study flames carefully, you know that blue flames are hotter than red flames. Massive stars are big, hot, and blue. They're called blue giants. Less massive stars are smaller, colder, and red. They're called red dwarfs. Between these two extremes is my favorite star, the sun. The sun is a yellow, medium-sized star. In these videos, we're going to measure things based on the sun. We'll measure mass in terms of solar mass, where one solar mass equals the mass of the sun. Massive stars are bright. The brightness or luminosity of a star is roughly proportional to its mass cubed. Although massive stars have much more hydrogen fuel, they burn through it so much faster. A star 10 times heavier than the sun is over a thousand times brighter. While our sun will last about 10 billion years, the heavier star will only last about 30 million years. On the other hand, a star that's a tenth the size of the sun will burn so dimly that it will last much longer, trillions of years. Most stars are small. Small red dwarfs are very common. Yellow stars like our sun are less common and blue giants are very rare. Just like how there are a few rich billionaires and many poor people, so too there are a few big blue giants and many red dwarfs. A useful way to think about stars is to plot their color and brightness. A plot like this is called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or an HR diagram. Brightness goes from top to bottom. Bright stars at the top, dim stars at the bottom. Color and temperature go left to right. Hot blue stars are on the left, and cold red stars are on the right. The brightness and color of a star can be directly measured. I made another video explaining how to do this, called How to Measure the Stars. We can see lots of patterns in this diagram. Most stars are found along a band that goes across the diagram. This is called the main sequence, and I've been talking about stars that are on the main sequence. The bright blue stars are in the upper left, and the small dim stars are in the bottom right. Stars are born on the main sequence, and they spend most of their lives there. Our sun is right here now. Stars leave the main sequence as they get old. We've seen that the brightness of a star depends on its temperature, but it also depends on its size. 
a star will produce more light if you raise its temperature or increase its size. And you can calculate the radius of a star by taking its brightness and adjusting for temperature. The biggest stars are in the upper right corner. These lines represent stars having different sizes. Along this line, the stars all have the same radius as the sun. Along this line, they're 10 times bigger. On this line, they're 100 times bigger, and then 1,000 times bigger. As you go up and to the right, the stars get bigger. This is where the giants are. These are the giants, the supergiants, the hypergiants. It's quite shocking how large these stars are. Betelgeuse is a bright red star on the shoulder of Orion. The Earth is about 100 times smaller than the Sun, but the Sun is 1,000 times smaller than Betelgeuse. In the opposite extreme, the bottom left corner of the diagram has stars that are very hot but very dim, which means they must be small. These are the dwarfs. This section is for white dwarfs, the remains of dead stars. Stars are powered by nuclear reactions. In one of my older videos, I talk all about the reactions that happen inside the sun. I'll just summarize the main points here. Inside every atom is a nucleus that's made of protons and neutrons. If we combine or fuse together two nuclei, we have a nuclear reaction. These reactions can release lots of energy, but they only happen when the nuclei are extremely close. Otherwise, they will electrically repel one another. They can only overcome this obstacle if they're moving very fast. In other words, they must have a high temperature. We're talking millions of degrees here. If you're carrying around some hydrogen at room temperature, you're not going to get a nuclear explosion. Hydrogen nuclei are actually the easiest ones to fuse together. They each have only one proton. Other elements repel each other much harder and require much higher temperatures to fuse together. In my other video, we looked in detail at what is called the proton-proton chain. This is a series of three nuclear reactions. First, we smash two protons together, and one of the protons turns into a neutron through beta decay. The result is hydrogen-2. Second, we add a proton to make helium-3. Third, we smash two helium-3 nuclei together to make helium-4. The proton-proton chain is how the sun converts hydrogen into helium. But heavier stars have a different way of doing this. It's called the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle, or just CNO. We start with one carbon nucleus and four protons. We'll end up with one carbon nucleus and one helium nucleus. The carbon here is acting as a catalyst. It helps make the reaction happen, but it's not consumed in the reaction. This gets a little complicated. We start with carbon-12. We add a proton to make nitrogen-13. Then the nitrogen beta decays. A proton decays into a neutron, turning nitrogen-13 into carbon-13. Adding a proton makes nitrogen-14. Adding another one makes oxygen-15, which will decay to nitrogen-15. Finally, if we add one more proton, it will emit a helium nucleus and give us back the carbon we started with. The CNO cycle and the proton-proton chain are two different ways of converting hydrogen into helium. But the CNO cycle needs more heat. Carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen have six, seven, and eight protons. This means that they repel other protons more strongly. So more temperature is needed to overcome this. Let's look at how temperature affects the rate of these reactions. The sun, for instance, is hot enough to do lots of proton-proton fusion, but not CNO fusion. This graph is on a log scale. What it shows here is that proton-proton fusion is about 100 times stronger than CNO in the sun. As temperature goes up, the rate of both these reactions increase, but CNO increases faster. The CNO cycle becomes the main reaction for any star that's 50% heavier than the sun. Neither reaction can happen if the temperature drops below 3 million degrees Kelvin. This is the lowest temperature a star can have. A star must have at least 8% the mass of the sun to be a real star. Planets like Jupiter are too small to do nuclear fusion. But there's something halfway between a planet and a star. It's called a brown dwarf. 
Brown dwarfs can only do part of the proton-proton chain. Remember, the chain had three steps. They're hot enough to do the second step, but not the first step. They cannot convert hydrogen-1 into hydrogen-2, but they can convert hydrogen-2 into helium. Most of the hydrogen in the universe is hydrogen-1. 99.98% of it is. But the remaining 0.02% is hydrogen too. There's not a lot of it, but brown dwarfs can convert this hydrogen too into helium. Objects that are below about 1% the mass of the sun are too small for this. Even the largest planet, Jupiter, is much too small to do fusion. At the center of every star is a nuclear furnace, generating lots of heat. This heat can move to the surface in a few different ways. In general, there are three ways to transfer heat. Conduction, convection, and radiation. Heat moves by conduction when you touch a hot metal plate, by convection when you boil a pot of water, and by radiation when you feel warm sunlight on your face. Conduction works through physical touch. Convection works by liquid and gas moving around. Radiation works by hot objects glowing and producing light. In the sun, conduction is not that important. The sun uses convection or radiation. Convection happens whenever there's a strong temperature gradient. Let me show you why. Imagine a star with hot gas on the bottom and cold gas on top, and high pressure on the bottom and low pressure on top. Let's consider two different scenarios. First, a slight change in temperature, and then a strong change. Consider a hot ball of gas that's at the bottom, and then it's lifted up. As it's lifted, the pressure decreases, the gas expands, and the gas cools. It's now the same temperature as the surrounding gas. Nothing interesting happens, and that's the point. But something interesting does happen when there's a strong temperature gradient. We start with the same hot ball of gas. It's lifted up, the pressure decreases, the gas expands, the gas cools. But notice, it's still hotter than the surrounding gas. It's still less dense than the surrounding gas. So this ball of gas continues to rise. This happens for all the gas. Everything is put into motion. Hot gas is bubbling to the top. Cool gas is falling to the bottom. This is convection. A star can have a strong temperature gradient for two reasons. First, it could be doing CNO fusion. CNO fusion is very sensitive to temperature. This means that energy production is tightly concentrated, leading to a strong temperature gradient. The second reason has to do with transparency. At high temperatures, hydrogen is transparent and allows light to pass through it. At cooler temperatures, hydrogen is opaque because it's ionizing, and so it blocks and absorbs light. In the center of the sun, hydrogen is hot and transparent. On the outside, it's cool and opaque. Light radiation can't pass through. The light energy is absorbed there, leading to a strong temperature gradient, which means convection. Convection happens around the outside of the sun, not in the middle. And we can see convection on the outside. The sun is bubbling like a pot of water. Small stars are cold. Cold stars are more opaque and have larger convection zones. The convection zone will fill up the whole star if it's below half a solar mass. Massive stars do CNO fusion, which means they're the opposite of the sun. They have convection in the middle and radiation on the outside. If there's no convection in the center of a star, the helium can settle there without being disturbed. But if there is convection, the helium and hydrogen will mix together. In this video, we've learned about the different kinds of stars, about their nuclear reactions, and their internal structure. We've learned how stars normally operate. In my next video, we're going to talk about what happens to star as it gets old. For more astronomical videos, please click to subscribe.